Every time that I am uh, blessed to preach, I am reminded to be thankful for Pastor One, uh, because I love it when Pastor One preaches. But today you get me, which I'm going to do the best that I can, all right? Uh, And here's our big idea for this morning. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you our big idea, and then I'm going to read the passage, and then we're going to pray. The end is always near. Look, here's the deal. I never start off on a high on a high note, all right? So the end is always near, and Jesus is nearer to you than every pain, sorrow, and hardship you faced. Shelter secure in him. Let me read our passage for us this morning. God is our refuge and strength, a proven help in trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid. Though the earth trembles and the mountains topple into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake with its turmoil, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the dwelling place of the Most High. God is present with her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord. How he has brought desolations to the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow, shatters the spear. He burns their shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let me pray for us. God... We come to you this morning in need, whether we know it or not. And so, Lord, we ask that by your word and through your spirit, you would meet us here, that you would meet those needs that we have. God, I ask this morning that you would gift and re-gift faith to us so that we can look to you and know that you are our hiding place. You are our secure shelter. God, we will thank you for that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God is our refuge and strength, a proven help in trouble. I'm a baker. I don't know if you know that. Um, I can bake lots of different things, but I love baking bread. And here's one of the things that I've learned over time, is that when I've worked really hard on the dough and the loaf of bread, and then I go back to it, you know, three, four, 12 hours later, and it hasn't risen at all, that was a bad move. I had something went horribly wrong. Something has gone awry, and that's not a wry joke, okay? Something <laughs> has gone off. Probably the shop sold me some bad yeast. I'm going to have to start from scratch, okay? Uh, And and this is in this first verse here. God is our refuge and strength, a proven help in trouble. We're talking proof here. See, when when uh, when this dough is actually like overflowing from the mixing bowl, when I come to it the next day, that's when I know that maybe I've waited too long, but everything is going to turn out just fine. I've got to have that proof. And from the very beginning of our passage, which we are going to need this morning, we're talking about proof. Now, I don't know if you know this, but we are a people of promise. And I don't mean that your life and likely, your livelihood look promising. Maybe that's true. Okay, maybe you're going to build a ship, travel around the world, something like this, okay? Okay. We are a people of promise because we rest in the fact that we cannot and do not need to save ourselves. 
Jesus has gifted to us everything that we need to be safe in this world and in the next. So when we see that God is a proven help in trouble, here we are talking about the faith that has been gifted to us by Jesus. Throughout the rest of this passage, we can talk about sheltering, we can talk about hiding, but what I want you to understand is that we are talking about faith. We're talking about trust. We're talking about resting in and relying upon Jesus alone for all that we need. Because the things that follow after this don't seem so great. Therefore, we will not be afraid because of that proof. Though the earth trembles and the mountains topple into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake with its turmoil. I won't bore you with history lessons too much, okay? But instead, I just want to paint a couple of brief pictures for you. Imagine now, you're living right about here. And it's about the year 250 A.D. Everything seems normal. You're going about your business, you're hunting, you're gathering. You're doing what you need to do to provide for those around you. And then the next thing you know, some other people show up on the scene. People that, ah, there's some resemblance to the way that they speak with your language. But it's just different enough to be unsettling. It's just different enough, too, that um, they seem to have lots of different tools and implements. And unlike you, who may or may not be carrying a spear of some kind with flaked stone as the tip of it, or just sharpened wood, they seem to have some sort of hardened substance that can dig into the earth. They seem to have some sort of hardened substance that can kill with far greater efficiency than you can. You know what that is? That's the end of the world. <laughs> That's the end of your world. Everything is about to change. You either go along to get along or you go off into other areas where you will not thrive as you have been. I think about St. Augustine. Uh, he was uh, living in the third century, and while he was ministering, something awful was happening. The empire of Rome was falling. The eternal city was collapsing. This eternal city, which seemed like it would never fail, well... I'm going to mess up his name, so I'm not going to say it, but there's a, there's a savage <laughs> and a group of savage people from the north. And these people, they don't have what, a buttery language that flows off the tongue. When they speak, it sounds like growls. <laughs> you know what that is? That's the end of the world. We live in treacherous times. Yeah? We live in very treacherous times. As all people everywhere always have. Now, I've been in Pretoria long enough to know that sometimes when you go to the coffee shop and they don't have the oat milk, it's literally the end of the world. <laughs> I know that. I know it is. I know it is. And it's tragic. It really is. No, I don't want to belittle it that much. In your life, there are any number of circumstances that you know are utterly changing every single day that you will live out from here on out. The smallest thing can change what you've planned for yourself or what others have planned for you. Church, that's the end of the world. I want to give you just a little taste of that because God's people here are experiencing that. But there's something very unique about this psalm. Most of the other psalms that we've read, it's been about David. It's been about God's first people, Israel. 
But this is a psalm that's for you, church. We're going to come to that as we get closer to the end. But this is a psalm for Gentiles. This is a psalm that is preaching to you, inviting you into the safe shelter that is our Savior, Jesus. So, verses 2 and 3, the world is ending. When is a good time to pray? The holy ones say, wait, any time is a good time to pray. The holier ones say, I pray at all times, Wade. You know when a really good time to pray is? When you realize that you're in need. When you realize that you're in trouble. God is listening to you at all times, which could be a bit unsettling. But when you are in trouble, He is listening to you and He is acting on your behalf. He is a proven help in times of trouble. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Now, um, I, I, I do love poetry. Uh, I won't bore you with too much poetry. I'm not going to recite it either. I have to read it. And, and the font, the typeface is quite small this morning. But, but not, not necessarily one of my favorite American poets, but probably my favorite American poem by a man named Langston Hughes. I have seen rivers, and I'm sorry, I have to put a little bit of an affectation on my voice. It's just the way it is for this one. I can't, I can't do it any other way. I've tried. I've tried. If I sound too white doing it, it just doesn't come out. Yeah. I have known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood and human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi and I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers. Ancient, dusky rivers. And my soul has grown deep like the rivers. That's Langston Hughes. I got to see that, uh, that Mississippi turn a little bit golden in the sunset. <laughs> Water means something, right? I mean, in verse 3, we see oceans causing mountains to topple over. Devastation, destruction, waters causing the end of the world at the hand of God. And yet, in verse 4, what do we see? There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. In Genesis chapter 2, we see that there is a river floating, flowing from Eden, from the mountaintop of God. God is its source. It's flowing from that mountain. It's feeding other rivers, one of which is that Euphrates, right? And, and that river is not only blessing the garden, but it's blessing the world. We also see in Revelation chapter 22 that that river comes back. That that river is again flowing from the, the city, the mountaintop city of the Lord. And it is the water of life. Its source is Jesus. It's flowing from his throne. We're bookended by rivers. We're bookended by rivers in that ocean, that, that stormy ocean that is causing everything to crumble around you. Christian, I don't know if you know this, but your life, your soul <laughs> is identified by those waters, both of them. See, when you know Jesus as your Savior, what is one of the things that, that Jesus has called you to do? 
It is to be baptized. And in that baptism, you are picturing something, as as Paul tells us in Romans 6. You are picturing death and being raised to new life. Rooted, I want you to see yourself here in these waters. I want your soul to be marked and identified with those waters. Because in that storm, that stormy ocean that is making all things crumble, that is where your judgment is found. You are buried in those waters. And then you come up in verse 4. You come up from those waters in verse 4 in a stream, no longer rushing waters that are working to drown you. That death has taken place. And you are raised up to new life in that living stream that makes glad God's people. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Where is this? This is Zion. Um, Some of your translations might say, uh, this is the dwelling place of the Most High God. This is where God promises to meet His people. Rooted, where does God promise to meet you? That's a little bit of a harder question to answer. But I'll tell you where right now He is meeting you. He is meeting you in His Word this morning. We know that for all kinds of reasons, but... This word is not just simply something that Pastor One or myself or anyone else stands up here and talks about. This is a word that is living and active because this word also was made flesh in the person and work of Jesus. And so when this word is read, when it is sung, when it is prayed, when it is preached, when it's pictured in baptism in the Lord's Supper, That word, Jesus himself, is meeting you where you are. So where is the dwelling place of God? Well, he's in charge of everything. It's all his. And yet this morning for you, it's right here, right now. God is meeting you in his word. God is present with her. With whom? (laughs) With this city, with his people. And she will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. Here we're about to make a little turn. But I want you to see that the world is ending. The end is nigh. And yet that is exactly where God meets you. It's exactly where he is present with you. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And so here we have God's first people singing a song about their forefather Jacob and the good word that he delivered to them (laughs) about who God was and who he was for them. Although, if we really look at everything that we've seen thus far, we, feel, we could feel safe, but things are treacherous. His voice, his words melt the world. And that's why, as Pastor One brought to us last week, uh, let, let's give that a moment so that we can catch up to it. Say la. Come behold the works of the Lord. So this is going to be good, right? Now we get, to, we get to see the blessing. He has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars, wars cease to the end of the earth. Well, that also sounds good. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns their shields with fire. Desolations, burning, shattering, <laughs> destruction. We could go back to those waters at the beginning of this passage. Look, 
anything, anything that's wrong with this world, we could rightly see as the judgment of God. That's true. We probably shouldn't try to pin it down too much or say exactly why it's happening. But this world and us in this world, we are broken. And in our brokenness, this psalm is putting forward something that is simultaneously comforting and horrifying, that there is only one way to peace, and that is through God's destructive work of making all things right again. In fact, verse 10, you might have a coffee cup with this. (laughs) Be still and know that I am God. But this is not just a simple suggestion that God is making to us. He's not saying, would you, would you just slow down with me? Would you just be at peace with me? Because, because we see how we get to that peace. It's through the, the breaking of bows, the shattering of spears, and the burning of shields. We, could, we can and should hear this verse as a promise and as a word that is determining something. Your rage and fighting stops. It's another way that I've translated this up there. And you know that I am God. This is a command from God. Be still. Be still. I will be exalted among the nations, and I will be exalted in the earth. You guys know the Great Commission? Yeah, go to the ends of the earth, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You get it, right? You get it? I want you to think about this as a great commission, except for in the negative, right? When you say baptizing, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all, or teaching them to, to hold tightly to everything that I have commanded. That sounds very positive. Here, it sounds horrifying. <laughs> I will be exalted, says God. Now, we can, we can give glory to God all that we want, but this is one of the things that I always come back to, is that God will have his glory. He will force his glory to be known. How is he going to do it? Well, let me end here with verse 11. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So how's he going to do it? It's good to know that the God of all power and all authority, God Almighty, is present with us. It's good to know that he will make peace. It is good to know that even though it might seem like, and it always is, the world is ending. He's there with us. What about that proof back at the beginning, though? How are we going to have proof of this? Israel, they had lots of uh, examples, lots of proofs given to them. This psalm is, you could kind of view it as just a, a compilation of all the times that God came to the rescue. Yet we also know that in the history of Israel, God, at some point, didn't come to the rescue anymore. Instead, they got put out into exile. Because the truth of the matter is, they know that their father is Jacob, and we know that Jacob was a scoundrel. (laughs) you know he was a scoundrel that was taken care of and blessed by God that is true and yet in all of their running away and all of their leaning on their own understanding and their own strength and their own pride they got put out of the land and one day they thought it was all happening. They thought, yes, this is it. God is bringing us back into the land. We're going to rebuild that temple. Everything is going to go well for us. Except what they were working towards was moral reform. In building the walls, well, the walls never got completed. 
In rebuilding the temple, they looked around and said, this is rubble. The stones don't go back on top of one another. Our dream, our world has ended. They needed something far more than what they were looking for. They were still looking within themselves. And all of their pain and their sorrow and their hardship, they were saying, God, look at everything that we've come. Now you can come live with us again. Not understanding that God was always present with them. And so what did God do? He sent His Son. He sent His Son to die on a cross for their sins and for yours and for mine. Imagine this now. End of the world scenario. Battles taking place. And I don't know, maybe you've seen movies like this, maybe you haven't, but there's that one warrior that he comes onto the battlefield and everything stops, right? It's like champion versus champion time now. The, the enemy knows that once this warrior takes the field, they're finished. Jesus does this for us, except for he does it in the strangest way possible. He comes onto the battlefield in the midst of raging waters, in the midst of kingdoms, angling for power and for pieces of land and for little scraps of God's blessing. He doesn't come bearing a sword, not yet. He comes carrying a cross. And as he comes onto the battlefield, peace comes over the earth. Rooted fellowship, the Lord of hosts is with us. He is with us in the person and work of Jesus. In his word, he has promised that he would never leave or forsake us. In his word, he has guaranteed to us that our sins are forgiven. Our warfare has ended. Things do still look pretty dire, yeah? There's all sorts of nonsense all over the world. All the time. There is pain and sorrow and fear and hardship in your life right now. In this psalm, what I want you to hear is that Jesus is nearer to you than that end that we fear. Jesus is nearer to you than you think your sin is that's still clinging to you. Jesus is nearer to you than every pain, sorrow, and hardship that you face. Rooted fellowship, you can rest in and rely on Him. You can shelter secure in Him. What I want to do right now is uh, I want to take a, a short stop, okay? Because I've just thrown a lot of stuff at you. I've done it really fast. And our, our passage here, what does it say? Selah. <laughs> I want you to catch up to where we are. I, I need to catch up to where we are. There's something else that we want to do this morning, um, and that is that we want to take part in the Lord's Supper together. We want to take communion together. There's all kinds of reasons why we would do this, but one of the reasons why we would do this is because in His Word, Jesus promises to be present with us. He is present with you already if you know Him as your Savior through the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. He is dwelling in you and you in Him. But whenever we come and we hear the Word together, 
whenever we witness baptisms taking place, God attaches his word to that water. And he places the name of Jesus on those that are going into those crashing waves and coming up in that stream of living water. And when we take part in the Lord's Supper together, Jesus has attached himself, his word, to that bread and that juice. And he's reminding you, I am here with you. I am present with you, no matter what. I'm going to pray for us, and then I want to talk just a little bit more about the Lord's Supper. All right, let me pray. God, you are our refuge and strength. Be always our very present help in times of trouble. God, each of us come to you in need this morning, which makes this a perfect opportunity to pray. We look at a world falling, sometimes being built up and sometimes falling down around us. And that's when we know that we can come to you and that we can pray, not our will, but yours be done. God, we thank you that you have given us your Holy Spirit and that he continually gifts to us each and everything that we need to cling tightly to you. To always be resting in and relying upon you. God, we love you. We are thankful that no matter what we are facing, we know that you are here with us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite the band up. And I want to walk us through just a, a couple things in this meal that we're about to take part in together. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we read this. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for, for who? For you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, a new promise in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Church, what we have here is a really amazing opportunity. It could seem like a very solemn, serious thing. Let's take it as that. But it is also a celebration. Let me me just... A couple things that we should celebrate in this. One, the Apostle Paul conveys to us here that this isn't just um, a general meal generally for, you know, sometimes when you come to church and you do the thing. No, it's for you. Who's he speaking to right now? Corinthians, yes. He's speaking to you, Rooted Fellowship. It is for you. That blood shed, that body broken, for you. There are promises attached to this as well. When we come and we take part in this meal together, Jesus is promising something to you. He is promising to build up and strengthen his church through the power of his word and by the work of his Holy Spirit. It's not just a a symbol. It's not just a, not simply a picture of something. One of the things from Psalm 46 that we read this morning was this. Repeated. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. 
It's God himself. It's not some uh, picture of a fortress. <laughs> it's not some physical fortress. It's not just the walls that we're surrounded by this morning. No, no, no. It's a, it's a safe hiding place in God himself where he invites us into his home and he seats us at his table and he gives us a place and a plate and he blesses us. One more thing. Uh, you could have been taught all kinds of things about the Lord's Supper before and you might be saying, oh, Pastor Wade, I'm just, uh, I'm not sure I'm ready for this this morning. You know, I've got a lot of sin in my life. Good, bring it. Here's why. Because it is also through this meal where you are once again promised something that you already have, church, but it's the forgiveness of your sins. It's Jesus coming to you again and saying, I forgive you. And so the, the purpose of this meal is not to cut off fellowship with God. It's not to cut off fellowship with one another. The, the purpose of this meal the end of this meal is to mend. So let's take advantage of that, church. The band is going to play for us. They're going to sing for us. And I'm going to pray for us one more time as uh, some of our, our family group leaders uh, and pastors come up and uh, we'll be holding on to the plates just to try to make things flow a little bit more easily this morning, all right? All right, let me pray. Father God, we thank you for this meal that we are about to take part in. God, thank you that you have promised yourself to us in so many different ways. And Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. God, we thank you for uh, attaching yourself, uh, your word, to something so simple as some bread and juice. And yet, Lord, you promised to us that in this meal, you are present with us, ready to take on all of our sin, all of our fear, all of our doubts, our every pain, sorrow, and hardship. God, we thank you for that. And we ask that through this simple meal, you would be growing and strengthening rooted fellowship. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.